Thank you, worship team. Really great. Hey, isn't it wonderful to be back together? Can we just give a clap of praise for the opportunity to be together? So, um, yeah, wow, so good to see everyone. 
The government, when they gave a, they gave a very clear uh, directive for the churches to not meet, but restarting is kind of more gray. It's not as black and white. So we uh, have been given this opportunity, but we're still, you know, the guidelines, so social distancing and masks and, you know, still follow these things that we've, I guess, becoming normal part of life. So anyway, that's where we're at with the, the government, um, getting permission along with other churches. So we're grateful for the government's care and oversight of the churches. Um, so much is happening. It's been, you know, lockdown and, I don't know, church at home, what that's like for you. I'm so excited to have that, but also to be back. And I, I just love what, Andrew, what you prayed about and just, you know, what a time people are, I think, lonely and wondering a lot of big, pic- big questions about life. And it is a time, I think, to be bold in our witness and to invite people, not to tell them about sin, but about the love of God. So, Andrew, thank you so much for encouraging us. And just take one or two and say, Lord, I want to give these out to the right people this week. Show me, guide me to someone. So there's extra ones in the back. Also, we have the women sign up. Uh, Kelly Gascon will be in the back. You can sign up women for that uh, women women's uh, retreat day, which is going to be fantastic. So... Let's stand and sing the word of God as I love to do every time that we gather. And I think it's fitting that we sing Psalm 63 uh, for today's message. Um, So let's join our hearts together. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee, thus will I bless thee. I will lift up my hands unto thy name. If you believe that this morning, let's sing it ten times louder. Amen? And we're, we're not even at home, so we've got to sing loud because we're back together. Let's make this our prayer to the Lord this morning. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee, thus will I bless thee. I will lift up my hands unto thy name. And we do, Lord, lift up our hands to you as a sign, as an act of submission, of humility, Lord, an act to remind us that you are our God and we come under your authority this morning as we open up the word of God. I think of the words of Paul in him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. What a joy that is for us this morning as brothers and sisters, as the family of God, coming with boldness, Lord. We thank you for the wonder of salvation, Lord. And we also come with humble hearts, Lord, asking you this morning that you would do that heart surgery on us, Lord, that only you can do, that you would penetrate the deep places of our heart that we have blocked off to you, Lord, that you would search us, Lord, renew us and restore us. And we pray this for the church here in the north, that you would do what you can do, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on your people as your word goes forth, not just in this place, but in other places throughout this city, Lord, build your kingdom. And now, Lord, we pray as you taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, church. You can have a seat. And open up to the book of Genesis. It is really wonderful to be here with you all this morning. We're continuing this series. Gosh, it's been a month now. Uh, The 
HAF core values. I really enjoyed that, and I think I'll pick up some of those core values in the coming months, maybe every now and then look at one of those values. But back to this series that I feel God just put on my heart months ago about looking at race, reconciliation, and the gospel. And we're trying to think biblically and theologically about these themes that are very uh, big in our world today. They're hot topics, especially race and reconciliation, and we're trying to understand what the gospel says about these areas. Now, the purpose, just as a reminder, a refresher, is uh, what I said in the beginning, we're looking to engage in the church on these topics and how to then engage with the world and the society around us. And also, we want to be aware of our own biases and misunderstandings and even prejudices on this topic. And we want the Bible to inform our understanding and to correct maybe some wrong understandings that we've had. So this is kind of the series. And if you remember Genesis 1 to 9, we looked at the humanity, humanity and the image of God. And there I said, the big idea was our primary identity is that we are created in the image of God. And this gives every individual on planet Earth incredible worth and value before God. We also saw how this destroys every theory of racial superiority and inferiority. And so we're trying to form a biblical anthropology. Anthropology, the study of humanity. Genesis 1 we saw, gloriously made in the image of God. Genesis 3, tragically marred by the fall. And then you remember Genesis 9, that uh, theory, that myth of the so-called curse of Ham. And if you remember, we used that to show how, because of sin now, man wrongly interprets the Bible sometimes. And that passage has been used over the centuries uh, that is wrongly taught that Africans are subject to slavery. That was the passage that has been wrongly interpreted. That is not what the Bible teaches but we saw how we are being redeemed, restored, and remade into the perfect image of God that is Jesus Christ. As we grow as disciples, we begin to take on and reflect His image. Amen? Disciples growing into the image of Christ. Now, uh, I, I said this uh, last month when we started this image of a puzzle. I had a puzzle up here showing you we want to put the pieces of the puzzle together. We're trying to understand how the Bible puts these pieces together to develop this theme of race and reconciliation. And so today we're looking at Genesis 10 to 12, the origin of nations, language, and idolatry. So we're kind of taking three more pieces, putting them together, what does the Bible say about the nations and the origin of language and the origin of idolatry? We're going to skim the surface. Don't be overwhelmed. We're not going uh, into everything in these chapters, but we're looking at this big idea that's going to bring these chapters together. God sovereignly works to establish his presence and name among the nations of the earth. God is sovereign. Sovereign means that God is, he has absolute, unmatched rule, ownership, authority, control over creation and circumstances. God is the master of the universe. God has no rivals. And because God is sovereign, that means even mankind and the rebellion of the nations cannot hijack the plans of God. He will establish his name and presence among the nations. Now, what have we learned about in Genesis, let's, let's dig into Genesis here as you open up to Genesis 10. We've learned so far that Noah has three sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We've learned also, if you remember Genesis 9, uh, God, after the flood, God commanded the survivors to fill the earth. Uh, that goes back to what God said to fill the earth and multiply to Adam and Eve. So the first puzzle piece today is Genesis 10. This is called the table of nations. The descendants of Noah now, they're to spread out and repopulate the earth. And chapter 10 begins this way. These are the family records of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They also had sons after the flood. Now, this is a genealogy. It is a family tree. Now, how much do you know of your own family tree? 
You know much about your, your ancestors. I, I've been on Ancestry.com a few summers ago and tried to put my ancestry together. I can just go back to my great, great uh, ancestors, but I'm still trying to learn more. It's kind of uh, fun and interesting if you've done that. Or maybe you have a, a family book that's preserved and, and someone has written in there all your uh, ancestors. So that's what we're looking at, this genealogy. Now, the problem is I, our family histories, it's very interesting to learn, but when it comes to the Bible... Genealogies are kind of boring, right? Well, let's just be honest. A lot of uh, names that are difficult to pronounce, it's foreign, and so we often don't like it. We just skip over it. Now, don't worry. I know some of you may be looking at chapter 10 thinking, I'm ready to leave. This is going to be boring. We're not going through all of it. I want to pull out a few things. What the author does, anytime the author of a Bible is giving you a genealogy, we think it's boring, but it has tremendous significance. And I want to show you the pattern here in chapter 10. So here's the pattern. Japheth, the first son, you get all the descendants, and then there's this summary statement after the descendants. Here it is. Verse 5, the coastlands, people spread out into their lands. These are Japheth's sons by their notice. Clans, or your Bible may say family or tribe. In their nations, each group has it, had its own language. So how many categories? What'd you notice? There are four categories. Now let's go to the next son of Noah, Ham, and we get the descendants, verses 20, uh, 6 to 9, and then again, this summary statement. Look with me. Ham's sons, by their notice, clans, according to their languages, in their own lands and their nations. Notice the pattern. I've Matched it up with the color coding here. There's four categories, clans, languages, lands, and nations. Now, finally, we get to Shem. Read it later, verse 21 to 30, and then the summary statement. Here it is. Notice the pattern. These are Shem's sons by their notice, clans, according to their languages, in their lands, and their nations. Now, did you notice here how the Bible categorizes the repopulation of the earth? What's the method? Is it by what we would call today races, quote unquote. No, it's by clans, languages, lands, and nations. Now, some people today, they wrongly teach that this, Genesis 10, it shows that three distinct races have spread out. But that's not true. Genesis 10 is putting together the family genealogy and a map together. So here's a map if you want to trace out these 70 descendants of Noah's three sons, you would get Japheth is kind of Eurasia, modern-day Turkey, uh, Greece, Cyprus, and you go to Ham, you have Africa and Arabia, and then you get to Shem, and that's uh, Persia, uh, the Persian Gulf area. Now, interestingly, when you look at uh, these 10, uh, when you look at chapter 10, it doesn't include every nation, but 70. And, and 70 is a symbolic number in the Bible. It means completeness. So the Bible is making a point indirectly that mankind is one with perfect diversity according to God's sovereign plan. And this is how God fulfills the blessing to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, that was repeated to Noah and his sons, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Chapter 9, Genesis 10 is illustrating God's sovereign plan was for a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multinational human family. This is what unites the human, human beings as one human race. So the design of God's sovereign plan into one human family has unity and diversity as a human family. Diversity is not an accident. Now, the relevant question for us, sorry, the relevant question then is, well, what does this mean today in 2020 when we use the word races, quote unquote, or we hear this in our culture and society, races? Does then race, as we use it in a modern sense, does that even appear in the Bible? And if you ask a biologist, a sociologist, if you ask a politician this question today, you're going to get a lot of different answers. But how does the Bible, Genesis 10, divide humanity? We just saw that it was not by skin color what we would call races today, but we've, we've seen by territories, geographic, right? We've seen by linguistic categories. We've seen by a nation, political, and clan. They're 
family categories. So we can conclude, yes, the Bible categorizes humans, but no, not in the sense that we use races, quote unquote, today. So this is the tension that we live in here in 2020 in our modern world is that when you fill out an application or some kind of survey or a census and it says, what's your race? There's not one box, the human race, and you check it, right? We have categories. We have categories of races, quote unquote. And so this concept of races, it is a changing term. So for example, if you just look at my country of origin, America, and if you look at a census, you see that racial categories change. 100 years ago, there were five categories. Today, here's the census, there's 15 categories with an option to fill it in and you can even combine different categories. So just imagine what's this gonna look like in 20 or 50 years. This is why one theologian in her book, Race and Theology says, categories of race are fluid, shifting and socially constructed, yet they continue to have a profound influence on the lives of people. Now let's just look at this question from science. What would science have to say about this? Well, scientists widely agree that there is really only one biological race of humans. Christian author and writer Ken Ham says this in his great book, geneticists found if we take any two people from anywhere in the world, the basic genetic difference between two people is around 0.2% even if they came from the same people group. So from the level of genetics and biology, we could say the things that we think differentiate us really don't differentiate us at all. So when we speak of races today or you hear it in society, it is not a term or a concept that the Bible uses in the way that we use it today. Are you tracking with me? Now, you may say, well, then what's the theory of races? How did this come into existence? Well, that's a very complex answer. It could uh, be a whole nother message, but we just need to know that the understanding of race is that it's changed over the centuries. Uh, one helpful book that re- answers this question is Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes. The authors say this, race is largely an invention of the enlightenment that's the kind of 1700s intended to categorize the natural world into groups according to type race was believed to account for the difference between humans of different quote unquote kinds and you see it was this thinking in the 1700s that really paved the way for the evolutionary theory in the 1800s which gave reason for racism to be more accepted. Now, racial superiority, it didn't originate with Charles Darwin and his theory, but that evolutionary theory, it teaches that people evolved into higher and lower races. And this theory fueled, has fueled a particular form of racism that justifies certain kinds of abuses and discrimination. So what do we make of all this and and how do we engage in the world around us? Well, we just need to never forget how the Bible uses human categories. It's not the category of how we speak of race today. The Bible doesn't categorize people by the pigmentation of their skin. It's more helpful and I think accurate to think in the biblical terms of ethnicity or people groups, that is clusters of people that are bound by language or culture or geography or religion. And so this means if the Bible doesn't affirm that one race, quote unquote, is more inferior than another, then neither should we. And church, this is great reason and joy for us to praise God because God has sovereignly worked through the human race to bring about many ethnicities so his name and presence could be established among the nations. Amen? That is great news. God is doing that as we speak. Now, the second piece, chapter 11, this fits into chapter 10. Now, chapter 11 is the infamous Tower of Babel story, but here's what you need to know. Chapter 10 fits with chapter 11. It's like a puzzle. They come together and they pave the way for the next piece, chapter 12, to fit in perfectly. Now, notice here, 10 and 11, there's an opposing tension. 
You're going to see this. Now remember, Adam and Eve, um, what was the result of their disobedience in the garden? Well, before the fall, they were image bearers and they enjoyed dwelling in the presence of God, right? And after the fall, what happened? Well, they distorted the image of God and they fled from the presence of God, right? And now we get to the Tower of Babel, and this is really the devastating consequences of that. The nations we see descend into rebellion. Now, idolatry, they descend into rebellion and idolatry. And here's the thing. If you don't know much about the Bible, know this. Idolatry is a big issue in the Bible, and God's going to have to fix it. But he is sovereign, and he can establish his name and presence among the nations. Let's look at the story setting. Verse 1. At the whole time the earth had the notice, highlight it, circle it, had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. Now, I hope you're scratching your head thinking, wait a minute, Jason, same language. We just read chapter 10. <laughs> and chapter 10 said each descendant had their own language, right? I forget what color it was. Is this a contradiction in the Bible? Well, the answer is simple, no. The author didn't organize chapter 10 and 11 chronologically as we would do in our modern writing and stories. Uh, this is ancient literature. They don't write like we write. <laughs> chapter 11 comes before chapter 10. So here's the way you can look at it. Uh, think of it this way. Chapter 10, we just read, uh, is the summary of what happened. But chapter 11, Tower of Babel, tells how it happened. Babel is going to focus on the negative. And chapter 11 come together and they show how God sovereignly has worked to bring about positive from the negative to establish his name and presence among the nations. So we have seen so far in the setting here, there's one unified language, there's one unified movement eastward, and we're in Shinar. This is in the, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This is in the present day Iraq, ancient Mesopotamia, the great empires of the world. We've got uh, uh, Persian Empire, Babylonian, and the Assyrian Empire coming from this region. And here's the tension unfolding. They said to each other, come, let us make oven-fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now, what's happening here? Well, we already see first there's a sense of unity. Let us, let us, three times it shows a solidarity, a oneness. This is a picture of humanity uniting towards one aim. Secondly, there's a ingenuity. There's a technological advancement here, making bricks, mass production, and mortar being used to strengthen the structure. Third, we see a name for ourselves. In other words, they were aiming to have lasting fame. Now, make a name. Name in Hebrew is Shem. Can you repeat that? One more time. Shem. Tuck it away. Remember it in a moment. It's going to come back. Now, what is wrong with this picture? What was their sin? Well, remember, God commanded, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And instead of obeying as being image bearers, reflecting God's name and presence, they cared about their name. How? Well, we see this building project motivated by one spirit of pride, and they desired fame for their name. Now, maybe you're wondering, well, was this intentional? Yeah, it was intentional. It was not an accident. The key clue is, otherwise, we will be scattered. In the ESV, it says, lest we be scattered. That's a really uncommon word in English, lest. It means it's used after indicating fear, the possibility of something undesirable happening, which was what? The fear of God scattering, separating them out. And so, yes, they were aware of God's command. Remember, 
Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and he lived 350 years after the flood. So there has been plenty of time for God's commands to spread to these descendants. They had awareness of God's commands, but they chose self-glorification, and this is really a repeat of Garden of Eden version 2.0. They're repeating the devil's lie. In the Garden of Eden, you will be like God. And so they're continuing this. It's been continuing ever since the Garden of Eden, this lie, this refusal to live within God's given boundaries. Let me ask today where you're at in your life, are you perhaps in an area refusing to live within the boundaries that God has given you to live in? Is that true for you? Are you refusing in some way to live within the God-given boundaries that he has for your life? Now, Let's dig a little bit deeper into this rebellion. What's going on with this tower? Well, according to one Old Testament scholar, John Walton, they were trying to recreate sacred space. What do you mean, Jason, sacred space? Well, what did we have in the garden? We had sacred space. Man dwelled with God. Man had access to the presence of God. And what happened when they were expelled from the garden? They were kicked out. They lost the presence of God. They lost the sacred space. And so building a tower is man's way of trying to recover the presence of God on earth, but they're doing it according to their own plans and methods. Do you see this? You see their pride here and their selfish ambition building a tower to the heavens. Now, a tower, what is this tower? Well, we know from archaeological records, it would be a ziggurat. Now, this is how artists have tried to portray a ziggurat over the last 500 years in artwork, but thanks to archaeology, we have over 30 of these that are ziggurats in modern-day Iraq. I mean, this is phenomenal. Can you see on the right there? Uh, ziggurat of Ur. Imagine the skyline of the day filled with these. This is phenomenal that we can see what a ziggurat uh, looks like. This is four, over 4,000 years old. Now, what's the purpose of it? Here's where we need to tune into some ancient cultural background. They would build these next to the temple and it would be a part of sacred space. It was not used for a personal lookout tower to go up and get a great view. You wouldn't go up there to have a picnic with your family. It was used for sacred space. And so it was built for the gods to come down and enter into the temple and receive worship. And so what were they doing in their pride and self-determination? They were making a name for themselves by trying to manipulate the presence of the divine. You see this, they're trying to reestablish sacred space on earth with their cleverness and their skill, trying to restore what was lost in the garden, Genesis Genesis 3. And you see, they should have been making a name for God, but instead they were making a name for themselves. And so the religion that they had adopted was, well, let's make the gods happy. They would make towers and ancient uh, worship houses in these temples to appease the gods. And they would think, well, if the gods will protect us, well, then we'll be blessed, we'll be prosperous, they'll give us favor, and then we'll become great and make a name for ourselves. What was God's plan from the beginning? Sacred space for God and man was so man could exalt God's name. God would sovereignly work not apart from man, but through his image bearers to establish his presence and his name among the nations. Now, this religion is not very different from what we see today in Eastern meditation or Eastern religions, right? Where you see some latest guru or some teacher of meditation. They're trying to teach you how you can discover sacred space today and with this kind of higher power, whatever it is that they believe in, some deity. But it's not even much different from, I think, what some of us practice in our Christianity where we do the same. We try to have God come down in our lives and bless us, but it's on our terms, not according to God's terms. We wrongly think, well, you know, I'm going to still 
live in sin and, and do some things that I, I'm justifying in my own mind, this sin, rationalizing it. But if I just do the right things, God will still come down and bless me. You see, that is not biblical Christianity. That is self-made religion because you're trying to manipulate the presence of God just like they were doing at Babel and God will have nothing of this. How does he respond? Let's look at the text, verse five. The Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if they have begun to do this as one people all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. Now, notice here, God is indirectly mocking the people because man said, let's go up, and God says, I'm going to come down. It's like God saying, hey, your attempt to even get up to me, you got nowhere. I still need to come down. Now, don't misunderstand this. God doesn't actually need to investigate his universe to find out what is happening. He's all-knowing. But the author is telling us this account in a way that kind of dramatizes uh, God's response to engage us, the reader. He wants to highlight the folly and the pride of the builders. Now, notice when God says nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them, it doesn't mean that God is always, you know, God's fearful and he's worried that someday they're going to become as powerful as God. What God is saying is instead of He's, he's showing that there is this dismay that the people left unchecked would do extraordinary deeds of evil and rebellion. And how does a sovereign God work? Well, what people would not do in obedience, God would sovereignly work through his judgment. You see, this man's disobedience could not hijack the plan of God. The irony here in the story is also, you know, not all unity is from God. Do you see that? Not all unity is from God and not all disunity is from Satan because the wrong kind of unity here brought God's judgment, his scattering, and what they feared most came upon them. But how does God establish his name and presence in light of their rebellion? Look at verse 8 there. The Lord scattered them over the face of the earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babylon, for there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So here we see man's best attempt, unified pride, unified language, unified vision of work. God sovereignly interrupted their project and confused their speech. Now, we've seen so far the origin of the nations, the origin of uh, idolatry, and now, church, we have seen the origin of languages. Now, maybe you're wondering, how did God do this? <laughs> I mean, did he say, hey, you know, one-tenth of the city over here, you're getting Spanish, and over here, this side of the temple, you're getting Russian. I mean, we don't know God's methodology. I would like to know. But here's what I want us to see. Did you know right here, uh, or let me say this, do you know that the origin of language is a mystery for the unbeliever? Did you know that? Secular scientists, anthropologists, the atheists, it is a mystery for them. But if you believe the Bible, we have our answer right here. And I want you to know this, that over the centuries, there have been secular, that is non-biblical theories of languages. And all of them have been challenged. They have been discounted. Some have even been ridiculed. One secular scientist I, uh, in, says this, the origin of language is the hardest problem in science today. This is a secular scientist. <laughs> You see, language is the one area that really differentiates uh, people from, you know, apes and the animal kingdom. One of the greatest linguists of the last hundred years, if you've studied linguists, you would know this man. He says it is impossible to account for language from evolution. This is remarkable. Even the leading, uh, Richard Dawkins, the leading, if you've heard of his name, leading 
atheist and evolutionary biologist, he says in his own, wor his own words, this is an atheist saying, it is impossible to explain the origin of human language. Why? We have an answer right here. Why? Because when language first appeared, it was very, it's complex. There's no evolution of language. Language emerges as a complete package. Church, we have our answer right here. God has sovereignly worked at the scattering of Babel. Linguists believe, Creation Research Institute, uh, this is where I get this information. They say that at Babel, it would have produced about 70 languages. And then from there, we would have 100 language families. And then over 5,000 years, it is not difficult to imagine having the over 6,000 languages that we have today. Church, this is how a sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise God works. And this draws us into praise and worship of the greatness of God. Amen. Remarkable. We have an answer to the origin of language. Now, why did God do this? Well, he sovereignly judged man's self-made unity. And so this language diversity, it did bring an aspect of alienation into uh, humanity. But interestingly here, what we see is that God renamed the city Babel or Babylon. And that means the gate of the gods. Now, it's interesting, God mocking again in an indirect way, because he renames it in Babel. It sounds like the Hebrew word balal, which means to confuse. So the gate of the gods became the gate of confusion. And Babylon goes down in the Bible as a godless, immoral city. What have we learned, church, about how a sovereign God works to establish his name and presence? He will work in a preventative way and he will also work in a punitive way, in a corrective way. And church, in his sovereignty, God will put down all those who exalt themselves. And yes, God at times, he may delay his judgment, but God always wins. His plans will always be established. And if it is not with man's cooperation and obedience, then God will do it in spite of man's disobedience. Let me ask you today, are you cooperating with the plan of God for your life? If you are resisting God in any area, it's not like God's going to say, okay, I give up, you win. God resists the proud, but he still is sovereign and he will still work his purposes. So then why stubbornly reject the plan of God for your life if you're a believer? Come to him and receive his grace by coming to him in humility and repentance. Now, sovereignly, God has worked, and we've seen here how God has worked, but we're kind of left with a big mess at the Tower of Babel. I mean, humanity isn't a mess, but how does God establish his name and presence? And so here's what happens. Look in your Bible Guess what happens after the Tower of Babel? Look in your Bible, verse 10 onwards. What do you see? Another boring genealogy. <laughs> Don't get up and leave. I want to show you why this is significant. We're not going to go through it all. But it is a strange timing to put another genealogy in, right? Why? But here's what happens. The genealogy begins this way, the family records of Shem. Remember, Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Remember, Shem means name. So the meaning of his name is name. Babylon, the people tried to make a name a Shem for themselves, and now God is sovereignly working through Shem, he will make a name for himself. And this becomes God's new pathway to reveal his name and presence to humanity. Because who comes from Shem? Look in your Bible. Abraham. It's like the Bible is taking the camera, zooming out on the mess at Babel and zooming in on one individual, Abraham. 
Abraham came from the place of rebellion, Ur. That's an ancient city in this region. It's not an accident that God is, do you see this? God is working within this place of rebellion, his new starting point to make his name great and his presence known. And so here's Abraham. He's living in this idolatrous society right around Babylon, and he has no idea what is in store for him. And look at the call that we're very familiar with. The Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, go out from the land. Notice the land, your relatives and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. Does that ring a bell? I will bless you and make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt and all the, here it is again, the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, we're very familiar, if you're a Christian, with the call of Abraham, but often we overlook the connection that it has back in Genesis 10. Did you notice the words I've highlighted in these colors? Land, nations, and families. Remember Genesis 10, what did we see? Lands, nations, and families. You see, it's not an accident that the writer here is using the same language. If Genesis could scream to us today, it would be, do you see the answer? That's what Genesis is saying. Do you see the answer? The answer to the pride and the rebellion and the idolatry of Genesis 3 to 11 is found in the promise of chapter 12. Because it's through Abraham that God counters the rebellion of man trying to make his name great and sovereignly establishes a new Shem, a new name to be great. Did you know, church, that Abraham, his name is revered by the three great world religions today? Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. That means the name of Abraham is great today. It is revered by over 4 billion people in the world today. But only the Christian believes that God has sovereignly used one man, Abraham, and his descendants to bring about one nation, Israel, God's chosen people, to provide the solution to the evil of humanity the strife of the nations, the brokenness in creation, because it's through Israel the promise of salvation has come. Not just for Israel, but for all of the nations, the people, and the ethnicities of the world. And when you fast forward to the New Testament, the name and the presence comes to a climax in Christ. Look with me, Matthew chapter one. How does the New Testament begin? A family tree the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son, there it is, of Abraham. As the son of Abraham, Jesus brings the blessing of eternal life to all the nations. And the apostle Paul says something very interesting about the name of Jesus in that great hymn that we learned about when we studied the book of Philippians. Let me read it to you. Jesus Christ, who existed in the form of God, Philippians 2, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Notice Paul's focus on the name. For this reason... God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and those who are under the earth. Friends, as we come to the end here, there is a day coming when every knee on planet earth will bow every knee. And if you love Jesus and if you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, then you, we will bow with joy and adoration and worship. Amen? But for some, one day you will bow, but you will be bowing because you've refused and rejected him as Lord and Savior. And so you will bow in fear of his coming judgment. 
and you see the pride and rebellion of humanity that has been raging since the Tower of Babel, all will be crushed and brought low before this name. You see, church, God has established and he is establishing the day among the nations and he will establish his name. And when that day comes, we need to remember there is gonna be global praise from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And that praise will be magnifying the full authority, the presence, the character of King Jesus, his name be ex being exalted globally among the nations. But I got to ask personally, is this name being exalted and established in your life today? Globally, a day is coming when the name of Jesus is going to be established. But ask yourself as we come into a time of prayer, are you allowing the name of Jesus? Are you allowing the presence, the work, the way of Christ, the love of Christ to be established in your own life today here, September 2020? Let's bow our heads together as we take a time to pray as the worship team comes up. Ask yourself this question, Lord, search my heart. If you're a believer, then you know this is what the Bible says about the end times. Jesus' name will be established. But come with humility right now before the Lord and say, Lord, is there an area that I have resisted where I'm not letting you establish your presence in my life? Take a minute right now before the Lord. Lord, we pray before you, God, search our heart. Speak to us in this time of response, Lord, that we would not get up and leave quickly. But we see how you're sovereignly working in the nations. But Lord, right now, do that heart work that only you can do. Take a minute and be humble. Don't turn from the presence of God, but come to the presence of God in humility, in confession. Take a few more minutes. Maybe for some, you have a heart of rebellion in an area of your life and you're just unwilling to turn it over to the Lord. He wants to establish his love, his kindness, his grace and mercy in that one area that you are unwilling to turn over to him. Turn to him in faith right now. Take another minute before we end our service. in 
for you. It's so great to be back together. Come up if you have any prayer requests. Maybe receive your benediction with your hands out in the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. To the only God our Father through Jesus Christ be glory, authority, dominion and power now and forevermore. May this be true of our lives here in Hanoi, Lord, and as we go out of these doors, we want to be a light to a world in need. Bring us people this week where we can share about the love and the goodness of God and the people of God said, amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday. See you next week. Please come up to the front if we could pray for you. Have a wonderful day.